Welcome everybody. Good evening. It's a very warm welcome that I bring you from um, of this rainy day in the room, uh, where we are going to have an um, excellent speaker, Dr. Claude this evening, uh, talking on the topic of um, understanding power safety. So, um, the word <laughs> safety is intriguing. Even more intriguing, our speaker is offering to take us on a journey from the Garden of Eden to the 2040s. His name is Douglas Ford. He works as a coach, he is an expert on leadership and selecting people. He's also a visiting professor of the University of Chichester. Douglas will talk for about 40 minutes, and then we're going to have some time for responses from our guests, who we're also delighted to welcome. Uh, we have Sue Jones. Dean of our cathedral. Um, Sue has, um, um, she's written a PhD on the topic of the personality profile of Andy Cooper. Very intriguing there. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so we are going to be bring a little bit from Sue and from our panel tonight, and also a very good welcome to Martin Henwood. Martin is the vicar of Dartford in Kent. Uh, he has held leadership roles in the NHS and in Dartford and has particularly studied what happens when people interact in groups. So, very welcome to you both as well. And then after that, it will be over to us to ask questions if we would like to. So, um, we'll have a chance as well to, to feed in. Now, yesterday, Douglas. Um, joined us in one of us right here, and um, and he reflected on an encounter he had with two people um, 40 years ago. He'd been recently um, thinking about how it, he now reframes that encounter as an angelic one, and uh, and one which has now shaped his vocation and sent him on a journey of healing and purposeful work. Or you could say. We enjoy thinking about whether uh, we too had ever entertained angels unawares. And um, considered as well whether our own memories might mean more than we understood at the time. So, without further ado, please would you welcome the members of the Thank you all very much. Um, this evening, I want to tell you three stories about knowledge, power, and danger. The first is from the present day. The second goes back to the Garden of Eden. The third goes forward to the 2040s. Taken together, I believe the three stories unwrap some hope for us in a dark time. The hope for a wiser, more ethical, more human society for anyone born today but a hope which I think is only fully realized in the life of Christ. We will be more knowledgeable and less frightened of our dependence on each other. We will be more knowledgeable and less frightened of our dependence on God. And we will have a more knowledgeable, less frightened, understanding of the power. In the course of 40 minutes, I'm going to try and discuss the gaping hole in the Western soul and how the second form in the Bible, yes, I think there is one, is full of relevance to it. But to kick off with our first story, I need you to join me now in your mind in the boardroom of the British organisation, which you know about and which has uh, many outlets in this city. My book in this opens with this coaching situation, which I was in a few years ago. Henry is the chief executive of a large organization with tens of thousands of employees. Catherine is his financier. Of course, Henry and Catherine are not their real names. Days are long and problems arise all the time. Keeping the show on the road, on a job of this scale, falls to Henry's number two, his operations chief. And when that person resigns, Henry asks Catherine, temporarily, to fill the gap, to be Henry's number two and 
keep doing her day job at the same time. Temporarily lasts more than a year, during which time I become Catherine's coach. Coaching leaders is my main work. For doing both jobs, Catherine receives about 10% extra on her salary. When at last, the long search for a permanent number two is over, Henry says something nice to Catherine about a special purpose. But it's over. When the day comes, for paying bonuses, all Catherine gets is a humiliating disappointment in front of junior staff. Catherine is furious, but also at a loss. Can she take on her boss? Should she? To take on the top boss in a he said, she said, is usually to lose your job, as well as the power struggle. But this time, it's Henry who's invited a few weeks later to spend more time with his family. Although this outcome is unusual, my experience is that the interplay of knowledge, power, and danger in this story is not unusual. One danger I refer to is the danger of losing your job and perhaps your reputation. Power is easy to spot. Henry has a lot of it, which he uses unjustly. In corporate life, this happens, but is discussed rarely. Oh, it's really discussed. Only a few senior executives, like Catherine, will be in the know. All of them not only have mortgages to pay, but also take seriously their duty not to trash the reputation of the organization which they help lead. In this case, Henry's power makes the countervailing power of the board, and they ask him to go. But nothing of this is explained publicly. A few are in the know. Most of us are ignorant, and the widespread ignorance isn't accidental. But this story is also about a much a different and much more consequential pattern of knowledge and ignorance. This is more than about a corporate dirty worship. There's a bigger ignorance here. Once again, it is a pattern in which a few are in the know. Most of us are ignorant, and the ignorance is not accidental. That is knowledge about power itself as a subject. On that topic, not even Catherine was particularly in the know, despite her extensive business education, which had nothing really to say about how to respond to a boss's bully. When I coach someone in a situation like this, Typically, they see a bleak, chaotic situation with only a few options for action. Typically, a coaching in a Catherine type of situation might see only two possibilities, both stomach churning. One is to suck up the abuse, and the other is to lodge a grievance. The latter will probably involve lawyers, with nothing in writing, the CEO will probably win. Meanwhile, the complainant's danger will become deeply unpleasant, and she may face obstacles in landing a better job somewhere else. Part of what I try to bring into situations like this is empathy and calm thinking, but another part is knowledge about power. I know that, almost always, there are more options for action than the initial shock reveals. Often I encourage a brainstorming approach covering every possible response my coachee and I can think of. Now, some of those possibilities will be unethical, but naming them in a safe place will be cathartic. Doing this work will contribute to a calm, ethically informed final decision. But along the way, smarter and different options will pop into view. We may discover how Catherine could act in an ethical but politically skilled way which doesn't leave all the risk on the innocent part. To be politically skilled is to be knowledgeable about that. Any leader has at least a little bit of this knowledge, perhaps unwittingly, but mostly our leaders, especially our more team-spirited ethical leaders like Catherine, are not in the know about how. They don't know much and they fear 
And they are fearful because they are smart, not because they're weak. They notice that courses for future leaders bear on about each man, influence and authenticity, but not about power. They absorb exhortations about doing the right thing. But teaching your master lesson is never given as an example. And of course, they notice we all do what is spoken about plainly and what is only said in whispers. Even children notice that. And then they look at the leaders of public. Those who relish talking about power tend to have distended egos and no nerves. They have lost something precious about being human, and our ethical leaders do not want to end up. The result is that the Catherines of this world fear that knowledge about power is dangerous. So my role becomes in part to help them understand power safely. When decent leaders choose not to understand power, they get hurt, and so do we, because shaking the material world is left disproportionately to the selfish, to the ruthless, to our least human leaders. For 18 years, I was a headhunter, hanging around the seats of power and helping fill. I have also been a leader. Yet I was as much in the dark as Catherine about power until I quit headhunting and completed a doctorate in management. I just find a nerdy thing to do. In fact, it creates the risk that you become so obsessed with your new knowledge that you can only talk about it using very long words. <laughs> Sometimes there are good reasons for academics to use long words. And frankly, I am just as insecure as any of you. So I have written an essay with long words in it about this problem called Understanding Power Safety. And you can download that for free from my writing website. In that essay, I don't take any religious view. But because tonight I passionately want to speak as a Christian. Because I think it matters that we join Catherine's predicament up with the garden of Eden and the gentle teachings. But I'm going to take a shortcut and just ask you to take what I next say as if you will the fruit of my practical experience as a coach. I think there are dangers to understanding that. Those dangers include losing your soul, like the journey, losing whatever is most precious to you about being human. To manage those dangers and understand power safely, I believe we need to ask three questions of any text or any person, myself included, who claims to offer insight into power. Test one Is power understood to be inseparable from ethics? Most books you could pick up today with power in the title will fail this test. Power will be presented as a set of ethically neutral, possibly scientific, techniques for getting your own way. Gun manufacturers do exactly the same thing. They claim that their products are neither good nor bad. The ethics, they say, lies probably in the people who use the guns. But power is a much more complex thing than a gun. It's part of the brand and being of human relationships. So what does test one mean in a Henry and Catherine situation, where it's my words and coaching actions that are doing any teaching? It means my earning Catherine's trust that whatever feelings and possible actions we discuss, she will not end up with her soul carelessly left behind in some supposedly neutral ethical desert. That I commit to her in two senses, that we will look for wisdom, wholeness and power together. Meaning that, A, we will look together for these things and that we will look for these things, wholeness, wisdom and power, and ethics to be found together. So, test one, power inseparable from ethics. Test two, is your existence and good understood to be inseparable from mine and from other people? Now, an African name for this is Ubuntu, and shortly I will return to this in the context of the Garden of Eden. But 
But for now, the test means throwing out of the window the concept of power most familiar in the West, which is the idea that power is the manipulative advantage of one in solitary individual over others. The want to warn us that if we try to play win-lose counterparts, I am on both sides of that system. What is good for Catherine and what is good for Henry and what is good for everyone affected by their organisation are joined at the hip. The test two, my good, my existence and my good and yours cannot be separated and each is separate. Test three, does the teacher or author or text stand before us as a human being open and vulnerable, open, for example, about how they gained and have personally applied the lessons that they are now offering. This has excluded most scientific and pseudoscientific teaching in which the author paints themselves in the invisible cloak of being an expert. In a coaching situation, it is likely to require attentively dealing with the other person, bringing knowledge where you can, but not pretending to it where you cannot. Know. A challenge familiar to anyone who has held another's hand in a tough place. To be clear, I am sure better ways to test whether other understandings of power are safe will come forward. But now we have what is a of power, something with which to explore power safely and unequivocally, instead of leaving the keys to the universe, the head. Probably the most instantly recognizable story about knowledge, power, and danger is the account of creation in Paul in the second and third chapters of Genesis. There is forbidden knowledge which results in death, yet God gives Adam and Eve the power to make that choice. He does not put the relevant tree beyond their reach. In order to offer a reading of this story from an Ubuntu perspective, I need to say a bit more about Ubuntu. My wife Patricia and I first made Ubuntu's acquaintance soon after we married in 19. South Africa became part of our lives to the extent that today we have many friends and a house in Johannesburg. Ubuntu also explains why many years later, as soon as I encountered the doctorate in management program at the University of Hertfordshire, I applied right away. Not that Ubuntu or Black African thinkers appeared in the program's perspectives. Indeed, the biggest influences on my own doctorate were frankly German, the sociologists Pierre Bourdieu and Norbert Elias. But the program made clear its commitment to exploring within Western scholarship the possibility of a radically social basis for human identity. And to me, that was a good to my own. Opening this year's land of conference of Anglican bishops, Bishop Vicentia of the Sutu used the word Ubuntu, brought to many of us by Desmond Tutu. It can be translated, I am because you are, or I am because we are. But then what the West we mostly do with this word is we put it on the mountains, treating it as an ornament, a charming way to describe being nice to other people. It is instead an alarm and a challenge, and frankly, in our dark times, it is an emergency. Ubuntu contradicts the Cartesian assumption, I think, therefore I am. By asking himself what was beyond doubt, Descartes attached his name to a worldview whose foundation element was a single disembodied mind. Now, since then, in academic philosophy, a vast amount of water has flowed under the average. But large parts of our daily life, business life, and political life, have Descartes baked inside. So much that we do, learn or say, amplifies the idea that each of us is a man trying to survive in a windows world, endowed with humanity by virtue of our faculty for rational choice. Now, some sayings you come across swim against this tie, for example, win win, or living more simply so that others may simply live. However, 
Descartes still lives inside us if we understand these phrases as choices about how to live. Ubuntu isn't a choice, it's a claim about how we come to exist. Christians are Ubuntu people. The Christian claim to personhood is, I am a person because God, who is relationship before all worlds, commands me to call him Abba, Father. And because that command is not directed at me alone, in the word Abba, Father, are already embedded the words system and reference. Last year, I had the privilege of giving some morning reflections at the Synod of Anglican Bishops for Southern Africa. I suggested that Christianity is like the world to square. We are in the world to with each other because we are all in the world to with God. Now let's listen to the story of the fall. We told with a sensitivity in our minds to the world person take it. When the fall happens, one thing changes before everything happens. Before Adam and Eve are naked and not ashamed. Then, in an instant, the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made loin cloths for themselves. But they sewed fig leaves together. They did not hide from each other, and then, this newly arrived shame is not sexualized. They are not ashamed of seeing each other naked. The shame is between self-conscious creatures and their creator. As Adam said, addressing God, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was not here, and I hid myself. So the shame is from is embarrassment at being embodied, turning out not to be of the same dignity as God at all. The clothing is needed to shield Adam's mind from the offence of his own body, likewise Eve. And so the disdain of the flesh has begun, a retreat towards a mind, the mind retreating from its own body, beginning to become like a dog, deploring the finite animal frame from which it contemplates the universe. Retreat of a mind towards their tribes. Next, every story relies on our imagination of what would have happened if the characters had acted differently. For years, I have assumed the balls of what if to be that Adam and Eve refused the apple and remained innocent and ignorant. That makes the story a story about obedience. But if we focus on a woman, I think a rather different what if appears quite obvious. What if Adam and Eve had stayed in relationship with God rather than stepping unilaterally outside? What if they had asked God to wipe away this tree if we are not to eat it? What makes this knowledge dangerous? Now we are in a very different meaning world, one in which I dare you to imagine God replying. I want to share that knowledge with you. But first, we're going to have to talk about understanding how to say it. Finally, a focus on the wound to promise us to notice some unfinished business. As Christians, we think we know what the fall's unfinished business is. We need a second Adam to do the work of redemption. Yes, and. From a wound to perspective, the fall isn't. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve fall out of the with God and the embodied creation. But they have not yet fallen out of the with each other. They leave the garden together, but having become like gods, God says so in Genesis 3.22. To eat fruit and gain knowledge is a big temptation for a human, but the temptation is suitable for gods or those who have become human are different. We are shown what those temptations are in Jesus' temptations in the desert. These temptations could only be equal to the world, the power to turn stones into bread, 
the power to jump in the temple uh, and be unhurt, the power to see the whole world and to control it. If Jesus is like an Adam had said yes, that would have been the same as Paul. In fact, the enforcing element of perspective, each of Jesus' knows emphasizes that he is staying in relationship <coughs> But that <coughs> we now out of the garden and now like gods, now facing the temptations of gods, we say yes to those questions. Here, illuminated by a to the story of knowledge and power and danger, which began in the garden, reaches its climax. Jesus is alone in the desert. The view offered from a high place in the desert and in Cartesian thought is offered to the perspective of a solitary mind, in which everything and everyone, including those to whom the person is present, becomes an object of manipulation. In the garden, we fall out of the wounds of God and creation. When we deeply enough inhale, I think, therefore I am, we finish the job and fall out of the water with each other. In this tale, to jump from the garden of Eden to the garden of Gethsemane is to miss a whole disc in the box set. The overlooked disc speaks directly to today's dark, lonely times. And a story about dangerous knowledge which God does not want us to have turns in this perspective into the story of what God will do, responding to our preach, to give us that knowledge safely. We have an essential task before turning the 2040s. I must answer how the Bible itself measures up against my three-part test for understanding the power of sin. Guess what? Does the Bible teach that power is inseparable from heaven? Yes, it teaches that nothing and no is beyond the reach of judgment. Within the first minute of opening the Bible, we read that even God's own actions are subject to his judgment, and God saw that it was good. As two, does the Bible teach that my existence and good are inseparable from my purpose? Is it an Ubuntu text? Yes, I have just argued that Christianity is Ubuntu spirit. As does the teacher or author stand before us? as a human being, open and vulnerable. Yes, that the greatest possible cost is the incarnation. So perhaps God does want us to understand how to say Coming in this October, I have an exciting opportunity to work for six weeks with a group of 17-year-olds in an East London state school, working through a prototype Introduction to understanding the power of safety. I owe the opportunity to the teacher who read my opinions and made the effort to get in touch. It feels a bit like the right of us almost 120 years ago. If we managed to do it in 12 seconds, I think we'll count it as a success. <laughs> as I've explained earlier, I wrote in an essay explaining these things in this talk from a second of perspective and the work I would do in that school was from a second. But my goal in six weeks will not be so much to answer a question as to ask one. Indeed, to make a question burn in the course of participants' minds. I want them to notice that there is something puzzling about the education options they face, something which makes no sense. The question I want them to become entranced by is why isn't it straightforward to go to university to study power? If you're sufficiently gifted and hardworking, you can go to university to study psychology, or sociology, history, math, law, or maybe law, or economics, or philosophy, or even mathematics, which you can get. In each of these subjects, you can study a little bit of power, but only after breaking your brains on a huge mass of unrepentant stuff. If you choose politics, you will study power. But only from the perspective of really, the governing nations and societies. Um, neither Henry or Catherine were particularly interested in that. If understanding power safety is fundamental to human flourish, which I say it is, if it is an intellectually rich, multifaceted subject worthy of a university education, which I think is beyond that, 
is clearly capable of stretching minds of the dark world. If it is as relevant or more so to creating a just, tolerant, and prosperous society, then business and management is currently the most slender subjects in Britain that I've been around the Why cannot today's 17 year olds tick a box and say, I'd like to study power, please? The course available today, which has the most obvious potential to approximate the study of power, may be philosophy, politics, and economics at Oxford. Which is perhaps why so many of our prime ministers turn out to have started to turn out. But I'm interested in knowledge about power for the many rather than the few. So I'm also imagining the futures of two children, Abby and Kumar, both born in Britain later this year, both going to university in 2040. In Abby's future, our higher education system changes. Programs typically called Power and Human Flourishing start appearing at many universities. Some will expect you to leave Foucault in your first year, others will have a more how-to year. Some are reflective, drawing on students' already diverse experiences of power and belief in families, in schools, in gangs, in religious groups, and on social media. Joint programs will be all the language, power in modern languages, power in history, Power in business, power in gender, power in climate. Each addresses in their own way the linkages between knowledge, power, and danger. Each would help Abby thrive in whatever kind of life she pursues, not simply because the knowledge that she carries in her head. That would be a very Cartesian thing to think about it. Because a university system such as I have just described could only exist in a society in which learning about power. And discussing power issues openly and naturally is taken for granted at every stage of someone's career. That world, Abby's future world, is not a world free of bad deeds, but it is a world in which there are fewer enemies, because as a society we will produce and promote fewer of Instead of a society of the largely power blood, in which one-eyed enemies can be kicked. Abby will help create a society of the sight in which the ethically deficient use of power shows up as the weakness it truly is. What Abby's world is possible? I'm not sure that's what I'm going to get. I'm not sure universities can or will change in the way this future is <coughs> In the first place, power is intrinsically not a discipline. I cannot imagine how we could teach it at all at university level without bringing together as a minimum philosophy, sociology, etc. And the institutional structure of knowledge at universities means that it's very hard indeed to do multidisciplinary innovation. And the reasons for this institutional inertia are not all bad. But there are two big problems. First, the better part of and so that's powerful parts of university. For example, those teaching STEM subjects, economics and management, may have they can't too deeply embedded to be able for the university system to escape. And so, is it in the interest of the power for the rest of us to understand our safety? If I'm an employer, will I want to hire a graduate with a first class honors in power? So then imagine. A different future, and for in Kumar's future, in which the church is a fact. In the 2020s, the church wraps its mind around understanding how it's safe. By the time Kumar is eight, in 2030, several theological colleges have integrated the subject into priest training. There, the subject is understood in a faith filled way, but priests are also given the skills. To open the students' minds and facilitate discussions which do not require a prior faith commitment. And it is as a 15, 16, and 17 year old taught by a priest contributing to the Life Skills program that Kumar's arms are open. Unlike Anna, Kumar will not have straightforward options to study power deeply and safely at college. Let's say instead he chooses economics and business. But as he does so, and when he gets a job, and when he gets sent for leadership training, 
He will remember the tests for understanding the currency. He will be aware and alert when a politician or media pundit is speaking with dead heart and stuff. He will understand why, in that view, power becomes the manipulation of others. And he will know that unless corrected by other perspectives, that teaching endangers not only the manipulated, but the manipulators. There have been times from the church of earlier days when what we had to offer was genuinely emancipated and received as some kind of law of But now our institutional and intellectual credibility has shrunk so much that Kumar's future may seem to you less likely than happiness. But I put it to you that the odds are the other way around. Because fundamentally, it is weakness that makes it possible to release the knowledge about power. And as Christians, we should find something quite familiar about that. I have put in front of me two pairs of footsteps going forward in the sands of time. But change doesn't like planting its feet where minds are already drawn. So neither of those scenarios will likely happen. But I do believe that one way or another, if we can survive the climate emergency, which is an enormous fear, a better future does await our view too. I believe that they will look back to our time in relation to power, as we look back to the 1950s in relation to sex. Knowledge will act, change will come, and our infinitely resourceful creator does intend us to understand power sex. That ends my third story about knowledge, power, and change. So in closing, I need to deal with three new sentences. First, in returning the Garden of Eden story so that it reaches forward to Jesus' temptations in the wilderness, I am, at least in the way I understand the Bible, straddling mythical time and historical time. So I should come clean on whether I can put a date on the second form. And you all heard some light relief, light relief, so I'm going to have to go. James Usher, the Archbishop of Armand, famously calculated that the creation took place at 6 p.m. on the 22nd of October, 4004 BC, although I'm not sure in which time zone. <laughs> How amusing God says the human would be if the second fall took place in Usher's own lifetime, say in the early 1600s. Let me propose that it did. In Britain, we understood the Ubuntu once. Indeed, we all know these words of John Donne, Demon St. Paul's Cathedral in London. No man is an island to entire itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Therefore, never send to know for whom the bell told us. It told us. Born in 1672, Donne died in 1631. Both events preceded by about 20 years the corresponding birth and death of René Descartes. James Usher was sort of squashed in the two. So, as a convenience of speech, I suggest the second call starts in that 20 year gap. Since, since both Don and Descartes lived for about 55 years, my 20 year gap is actually about 75 years. In coming back time and again to Descartes, I'm copying Steven Spielberg's 1993 movie Schindler's List, which he shot in black and white, except for one three year old girl in a red coat. Spielberg wanted us not to be blinded by the enormity of what he showed us, and he hoped to make his story more helpful. So Descartes is my thinker in the red coat. There were many, many parts. Secondly, I'm eagerly and gratefully awaiting my COVID booster this Wednesday. I am not anti science. What is fatal in the second fall is not the success of science, but the proliferation of science only thinking. The denial or diminution of any truth which is relational, the idolatry which excludes from existence anything which a solitary, abstract mind cannot inspect from the top of a scientific mountain and sweeps everything which can be so inspected into a tray of objects for manipulation. The second fall continues and it sounds. For example, in the last century, the pandemic spread with their part inside through economics, business, and management practices, has been propelled by explosive growth in the number of business schools. 
made worse after the Second World War through the doctrine of shareholder value maximization and the lonely, selfish, intellectual models which made that truth seem obvious. Finally, the publication of the prompted a fabulous question to me last year from Tara Mellon, the host of a podcast called The Game of Teams. She asked me, what is power if it's not the manipulation of others? I think any understanding of power sits like flesh and blood linked to an understanding of human individuality. That is why, in the end, understanding power is a necessity, not an option. If, within the world, we think society is made of solitary minds interacting with each other, then power has no option but to be manipulation. But if instead power is a complex feature of human relationships, present as soon as two or three are gathered together, if we are the world to be, what is power? In my secondary essay, I attempt a clumsy answer. But as Christians, we have a beautiful answer. Thus, when two or three are gathered together, bring in friends. Power, rightly understood, seems to me another name for the Holy Spirit, who, I contend, longs for us to understand as sick. And the family friend, for your time and attention. In the name of the one God, whose name may be judgment, love, and power. And like you, I have the opportunity to read to time and and each time I go back to the individual, something different happens. And I guess my immediate and get response as I can read it is yes, yes, yes. I can go with it and in what you're trying to um, argue here about power. And um, having been a victim is the right word, I'm not sure, but having been a victim of a powerful church in which I felt totally disabled to be able to, as you put in the open school, defend myself again, that's the right word. I can see how power can be misused. And I suppose um, there is just so much in here, and there's such a wealth of stuff I can spend all night talking to you about some of the issues. But for me, I've always seen my leadership, if that's even the right word, it's not my leadership, but in the context of the Rublev um, icon of the Trinity, having Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and myself in that picture as well, as a dispersed way of understanding what God has called me to be. And I suppose my question, which may be a bit of an unfair question, is in relation to the church. And um, it would be wonderful to see the vision of 2040 coming to fruition, where the church takes a stand and asks the question, what does power look like? But from my perspective, the church is caught up in power. The church has people in powerful positions, which is, I find, very difficult to confront that power. And I suppose my question to you is, how do we, because we are part of Christ, model something so profoundly different where power is shared, where we work together, two or three we gather together, where the God's kingdom, which isn't about manipulating people, but it's about engaging with people. What's to say sorry about that? <laughs> Nonsense. I think Douglas is often very prophetic, like Paul. And I want to share a story and make a couple of points. The story which goes back to my childhood at a non-public school. Which I was summoned to the house master's study 
um, and said, uh, you are to be killed. And as a 13 year old, I found myself absolutely terrified. And I found myself saying these words I am not going to allow you to gain me. Then I came out with these words I am not going to allow you to demean yourself as a human being. There was a moment that it could have gone either way. My housemaster said uh, that your parents have signed the board being permission to pay me. And I permission. What I then said was, I will take any other form of non-corporate And <coughs> I've told that story um, for sort of meals with friends many, many years ago, but I don't just really return to it because I now hear that word, I am not going to allow you to take me different from an Ubuntu perspective. I am who I am, and you are who you are, and we are who we are because of our identity together. And it only hit me, following the reading that was his lecture, that my housemaster, who was a Christian, may well have heard those words differently from a petulant and virgin. I am not going to allow you. You have, who do you think I am? God's name is slowed in the Old Testament because I am who I am and will be who I will be. We know the stories of God I am in the Old Testament, but I'm telling you there and then. God was present in the relationship between the two of us. Because he agreed not to use the pain. And I think that I wanted to say that it was terror that drove me to that place. But it wasn't just the only act of an individual or a man's master at that point. It was also that sense of I am God being present. We talk of God being present in lovey dummy situations, but God is also present in fairly confrontational things too. And that kind of thing is the church is not good. If you look at South Africa, you've got the Truth and Justice Commission, which took it on to, you know, that, that experience. We need to understand ourselves in relationship. We transform ourselves. That is how transform. And I believe that is what the church will have. And, and Sue, so I'll, I'll answer your question when you put to Douglas about how might the church do that and reply to Douglas as I think my last point. Which is the day part mind retreats into the mind. <coughs> but all of us know that we have a body. All of us know that we have a heart. And that we feel things through our heart and through our bodies. How much do you? Use and interpret that. I've been very privileged to do a course recently about that. And I'm thinking that if theological colleges were able to really get into the territory of understanding how much more we can use the information from our hearts and our bodies, we might then be able to really transform our relationships. The final thing I wanted to say was um, really about the institutions, but I'd like to say on the screens of the seconds. Work and build up as far as we now build up the school. And the one thing I want to say about that is the Descartes, the Western man, has built our human institutions from a fallen man position. We know man's going to want everything that he wants, 
we grab everything we want. So we'll spend 40% of our population is checking up on people. In an Ubuntu world, where it takes a whole village to raise a child, everybody plays their part. Now, I'm not naive to sort of say that nobody's going to try to cheat the system, but what if, what if every person really understood what it was? to be fully accountable to each and every one of us in the way that we acted. We could really employ so many people from checking up on each other. Finally, the last question I've got to ask is, how long have we let swathes of people not try? Huge resources. I want to make that because I do think that he's asked the dynamite question. And the church being in the situation for its weak in society. No, it's not weak in society. It's straight away. I heard, I heard Paul Sellers yesterday. It was wonderful. Wonderful because he spoke with them. Here he was in here. Start here, got this. The next day I wrote a translation in a number of different um, And that's on, it's free. It's on my writing website, which is just www.org.com. This talk, and I'm sorry if it's scripted, but I've been about two hours if I haven't scripted. I will post it by Wednesday. Um, so don't talk to come again, and uh, that will be free. And if you're interested to um, read the book, it leads. Um, the publisher has given them 25% off for this week, um, and uh, that's at time books. Just look at that as well. Go to the publisher's website. If you enter the code BRIDE, at the checkout, then 